uh, everyone. Um, I think this is our honor to have uh, Anthony Anthony Wong from the Hong Kong Council of Social Service hi, hi. be our uh, VIP today. Um, Anthony uh, is a long time um, pioneer uh, advocate in policy in Hong Kong. Uh, and he joined the council for more than 20 years and he has been uh, the most um, um, prominent advocate in uh, social policy and also social research in Hong Kong. So um, I think our um, today's lecture, uh, the, the seminar is about uh, community-based housing solutions in Hong Kong, which is a very um, vocal um, area in recent years in Hong Kong. And it actually uh, demonstrates some innovation and uh, cross-sector collaboration approaches in Hong Kong, which is a quite new a model of policy advocacy plus uh, service provision at the same time. So I think um, it would be great for Anthony to share his firsthand experience collaborating with different stakeholders, uh, you know, from the government sector, um, also in the NGO sector, and also in the market sector, especially the role played by the corporate and also the property owner. So this is a new model of social development and new model of social policy in Hong Kong. and and. Yeah, so Anthony, the floor is yours. I appreciate your most exciting and also very complicated um, uh, work so far. So okay, Anthony. Okay. Um, okay. okay, thank you, Sanju. Can, can I share my PowerPoint? Yes, uh, please. Because I, I am disabled to, uh, to share the screen. Oh, okay. Then, Let's see. Uh, oh, I can do now. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, this is a PowerPoint that I, I usually use uh, when I talk about our social housing project. Uh, as Chen Yu introduced, uh, I have been working in the council for over 20 years. I suppose that I don't know whether all the students here are social work students or maybe coming from social science faculty, but in any case, I would have to spend a bit, uh, I don't want to mention too much about the housing problem in Hong Kong because I, I think uh, a lot of people are actually quite familiar with the situation now. Oh, sorry, I, what I did, okay. And uh, rather, I would like to talk about uh, council first because uh, some of you may not know uh, what is Hong Kong Council of Social Service. Uh, a council is actually not a an organization uh, 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 providing direct service. We work as a federation of non-governmental organization in Hong Kong. Most of the social service agencies or NGOs in Hong Kong are actually members of our council. Currently, I think we have over 480 agency members. Uh, some of you may have heard like or agencies like Caritas, Salvation Army, Tongwa Group of Hospitals, and et cetera, et cetera. And all these are our agency members and they are operating over 3000 uh, social service units in different uh, scope of work. So um, um, I have to uh, you know, talk about our council because uh, uh, it is uh, quite closely related to what we are working on a social housing project because as you look at our council, it's like a, we work as a federation, but more and more we work like a, a platform by pooling resources and expertise from different sectors in the community in order to create something which could address the problems that we see in Hong Kong. And in addition to the kind of policy advocacy that we, are, we have been we are used to doing, like, you know, conduct a research and then conduct a, you know, press conference and then voice our opinion and our findings and then make some recommendation. These are all the things that many organizations in Hong Kong have been doing. And, uh, but on top of that, uh, particularly in the recent, maybe in recent five or seven years, we've been uh, changing, not changing. I think we've been trying to invent uh, another mode of advocacy, which is 
advocacy by doing. That is, we, we think that because there is something in the world that policymaker will not find it intelligible to understand in terms of words and ideas or in terms of speech. But if you create something concrete and let them to see that concrete thing, it's better it's a better tool for a better vehicle for us to advocate something that is difficult to uh, for people uh, and also for the policymaker to uh, comprehend. And that's why we are embarked on uh, this um, social housing project. I think I have to uh, talk a bit about the, the background behind this because I, uh, I think in the last administration, I, I would say, uh, the uh, the Transport and Housing Bureau, uh, the secretary back then is Anthony Zhang, Zhang Bingliang, Anthony Zhang. Uh, at that time, he conducted a kind of a 10 year housing strategy, something like that. And we seized the time to uh, advocate three major policy directions. The first one, of course, I mean, we focus on housing for the grassroots people, okay? And then we have three directions to suggest. The first, of course, is to build uh, public rental housing and then also home ownership scheme subsidized housing, basically, okay? This is the first thing, but this is something long-term. And at that time, the government has already projected that it will be very difficult for them to increase the supply in a very short term. So it will have to be a very long term. The second one, at that time, which is a very brand new thing. Nobody understand what we're talking about. That is transitional housing. So basically what we are now doing is transitional social housing. Why we say social housing, I will have to go back to that uh, if you're interested. And the third one is a bit of controversy, which is rent control. As some of you may not know that a, a community or a society like Hong Kong, everybody understand that we have a free economy so um, you know so much valorized by uh, overseas uh, uh, foundations or united states that we have uh, the fewest economy in the world but most of you may not know that in fact in most of the pre, uh, post-war time uh, hong kong was actually living in a regime of rent control until maybe 2004 when the government, you know, eliminated or eradicated all the policies related to rent control. And then uh, you see what happened in the last 20 years. And that's why we've been advocating for rent control. But of course, the government is not going to entertain us, uh, uh, even though they are now having a working group. But that is something. Uh, so basically, what I'm trying to say is that at that time, like, maybe 2015 or 14, uh, 15, yeah, 15, they launched a long-term housing strategy. And at, uh, at that time, I think I had a regular meeting with Anthony Zhang. Every three months, I had a meeting with him and we talked and talked and talked about uh, transition housing. And he, and the government and he himself always said that if we have a piece of land, we are not going to build a transitional housing. We are going to build a permanent housing. So transitional housing is not is something, you know, not possible according to what he said. But soon after uh, Carrie Lam uh, government, uh, you know, was elected. And then two weeks after that, the, the new secretary for the Tran uh, Transport and Housing Bureau uh, took up the office and two weeks after that, he had a visit in this uh, Society for Community Organization, uh, which is now one of the uh, major body uh, working on social housing. And he sort of cried on that occasion and then said that, well, oh, these grassroots people are living in so poor living environment. We have to do something. And we had to allow that some kind of housing of transitional nature should be given some uh, uh, due consideration. And in the same year, two months later, actually two months later, uh, our 
community housing movement was found, was launched. And my colleague said that, well, we actually didn't know what we are going to do, but we have to launch it first and then to figure out what we should do. But basically the idea is to provide um, people who have been queuing up for public rental housing for low less than three years, and also uh, who are low income, living in inadequate, actually very indecent housing conditions and having some urgent needs for community housing movement. And then we have, we, what we want to do is to provide uh, transitional housing. Well, I should say the community housing movement is not positioned like that, but we hope that there can be more transitional housing to provide uh, social housing units, which are affordable and also decent. By affordability, we think, we, we, we think that the rent should be low, may not be as low as the uh, public rent housing, but should be low, much lower than the market rate. And by decency, we mean uh, we promise some kind of uh, minimum per capita living space. So by which we actually uh, make reference to the public rental housing uh, standard, which is uh, low less than seven square meter per person. Okay. But uh, why I say that I would like to have uh, more provision of this kind of housing, uh, it is, I mean, it is, we are not, we, we have, we launched the pro this project not to, our position is not to provide housing per se. Our position is to do advocacy work by providing housing. Now this is different because the community housing movement at the time we promised to provide only 500 trans so transitional social housing units. This is a very, very small number as compared with over now is maybe about uh, 100,000 households living in uh, subdivided units, okay? So uh, we understand that this, this number is just too negligible to be able to provide anything to uh, fulfill the needs. But what is more important is to leverage on the provision of this 500 units and try to proliferate the idea by you know, creating, I, I would say, creating discourse. By discourse, we mean not only ver verbal discourse, but also in terms of practices, in terms of video, in terms of, um, you know, images. So, and then we, our, our target is to, the, f the, the more projects we launch, and we can always create stories from all these projects and then invite all the media to come over. And also, of course, to engage all the people to join our, uh, our endeavor. So I'm not going to go into very detail about our program. Uh, now, this is our role. A council, I think we position ourselves as an intermediary in the provision of housing, okay? We leverage on, of course, the support from the government, okay? And we leverage on the financial resources that we have got uh, from the community chest, community chest, and also from SRE fund to provide funding for us to operate our intermediary. And of course, in order to do this, we have to have the support from the developers and property owner. And, and, and uh, because, you know, you would ask why a social service organization were engaged in, um, you know, housing provision. So we have no expertise in architect, uh, surveying and all this stuff contractors. So we have to leverage on the professional knowledge and expertise in the construction sector. Uh, and also because we have to establish a lot of uh, relationship with different parties. So it involves a lot of uh, work on legal advice, uh, project management and all that. And the downstream, uh, by the time when we have obtained all this uh, housing flats and get it renovated, we uh, would uh, pass all this unit, package it, package all this unit in terms of different projects, and then kind of rent it out to the NGOs, and they are going to provide uh, social service, community-based service, in fact, to build a community of the tenants in that project, 
and also link them up with the uh, community resources. And then, of course, we have to uh, engage through NGOs, we have to engage tenants. So you see, as an intermediary, we try to leverage and also pull together resources and expertise and knowledge from different sectors, different stakeholders in the society to try to alleviate a major problem that we, we have seen. The major, um, the process of a community housing movement is like this. We try to leverage on the unused housing flat in Hong Kong. As we understand that, well, some of you may not know that a lot of uh, housing units in Hong Kong are actually vacant for different purposes, so for different reasons. Some of them are actually uh, wait, awaiting uh, demolition. Some of them are actually uh, just uh, leave it, un the owner are just leaving it unused. They don't know how to you know, rent it out or use it. In any case, they have spare units, okay? And by that, we have two major types of uh, owners. One are institutional owner, that is the developers, okay? So that's why we have got many units from uh, Henderson, and we have got many units from the Urban Renewal Authority, which is a statutory body providing, you know, sort of providing housing uh, anyway. And then there are, there are also another type of owners, which are individual owners from the communities. They may have one or two units spare. And then we, uh, we, we appeal to their support to the program by renting their flat out at a lower than the market rate, but of course, uh, the institutional owners, they will be able to provide those housing at a very nominal, very low rent, nominal rent by some of them are just, you know, $1 per unit. So by doing, by having all this unit, we, we have to, because all this, some of these units are very old and, you know, uh, poor in condition. So we have to leverage on the support from the uh, construction sectors to renovate it. And then after the renovation, we, you know, pass the units to the NGOs and then they provide service. One of the uh, issues which I also would like to uh, talk about is that I'm a social worker, by the way. Uh, so why am I, you know, engaged in, um, in this project? And why the council would be engaged in housing provision? Because our fundamental belief behind this project is not about housing even though all the stakeholders in the community or in the public are actually focusing on housing itself. But we are not talking about this. We, th we think that people who are living in subdivided units, uh, of course they are living in a very unaffordable and also in decent housing environment. The major problem that they experience is the fact that they are being excluded, socially excluded or socially isolated in a way that uh, if we are able to build a community and connecting them with the resources from the community, their quality of life may be uh, improved. In other words, we try to build the social network so that they will no longer be socially isolated. And we, we believe that with this social network and community support, from different stakeholders in the community, their livelihoods can be improved. And we are just trying to move them out of the subdivided units to our newly renovated social transition social housing to live for a couple of years and wait for the public rental housing. Even though by the time when they exit that project, that housing unit, they may not be able to get the uh, uh, you know public rental housing. They may have to go back to the uh, private rental market to rent a house. But um, we think that by having this experience, they, have, they will have learned that in fact, they can enjoy the resources in different communities because you know, different communities will have uh, similar service and resources set up. So long as they are informed that there are all these NGO stakeholders and all these you know, residents organization or you know, they will be able to uh, make use of those community resources in the in, in future, even though after they 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 uh, move out of our our unit. So uh, this is basically the belief that we are trying to uh, increase 
their their capacity, community living capacity, or advocacy, personal advocacy, in facing adversity and in you know handling their problem. So housing is actually one of the means, and of course, it's a very effective means if you are able to mobilize all this. How many? How much time I spent to talk? I think I'm going to talk about maybe five more minutes on modular housing. The same concept apply. Now, these are all the stakeholders that we've been involved. Uh, some of the community housing movement project, I would like to just give you a look. Uh, some in Kowloon City, in, uh, in Central and Western District by uh, Soko, uh, To Kwa Wan uh, by Sengong Boy, and uh, in uh, Southern District by uh, Hong Kong Zai, uh, in Kai Fong uh, uh, Welfare Association, and also To Kwa Wan by Salvation Army, and Tuyen Mun, uh, by uh, operate by Yan Oi Tong. So, and on top of that, be, uh, community housing movement is basically uh, trying to make use of the unused housing flats in the community built already. Okay, but there are also unused pieces of land in Hong Kong which can be used temporarily for our transitional housing project. So we basically use a modular uh, construction technique, uh, what they call MIC, modular integrated construction uh, technique uh, to uh, leverage on the unused land in the community and try to use that piece of land for a couple of years, like five years. If you, if like, uh, uh, like in, in the coming project, we actually got a, uh, some government land, which is what we call a short-term tenancy. Short-term tenancy, usually we can make use of that piece of land, government land for five years by applying to the lands department. And then we can use that five years and then assemble all these modules together. By module housing, we said, this is a prefabricated in, basically in mainland China, prefabricated and the, the whole house are prefabricated. And then you just transport from mainland China uh, to Hong Kong and then assemble. Um, and basically like our recently uh, launched project in Lam Chang Gai, uh, we call it Lam Chang 220. Uh, we have uh, eight, we have provided 89 un household, household units for one, two and three persons uh, household. And we basically use 68 modules, prefabricated modules, and then bisected some of them into uh, smaller units to accommodate people. And uh, the whole thing is that now uh, for the Lam Chang Gai project, we are going to use that piece of land, which is donated by uh, uh, Henderson for two years or maybe three years. So after three years, we can, you know, we can, these modules can uh, actually be mountable. So we can, you know, disassemble them and then transport to another site for another couple of years. So the duration for usage of this module came, the contractor was saying that, well, it can be used for over 20 years. And some of you may not know that in some other countries, like in Singapore, uh, Crown Plaza Hotel uh, at the Zheng Yi Airport, uh, is, was, is actually built by um, modules, uh, steel module. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, mature technique in construction. It's just, it's just so happened that in Hong Kong, we haven't introduced uh, uh, this, been, I mean, this kind of technique hasn't, hasn't been introduced until recently. So we leverage on this new technique and then build the first residential building in town for, uh, for to accommodate 89 uh, households in Hong Kong. And in the pipeline, we are going to have two more projects at least, uh, at Yam Zhou Gai also in uh, Sam Shui and also Yip Sen Gai. Yip Sen Gai is in uh, uh, Kwai Cheng, uh, another area. So we are going to provide two, over 200 units in Yan Chao Street and also uh, about 110 units in Yip Sen Gai. So these are, the initiative behind the um, the uh, the um, our idea 
uh, as you can see, we are actually providing a very small number of units, but over all these years, we've been trying to use, I, I don't have time to talk about our impact because the impact, if you are interested, I can share more, but you can look at all this. These are the videos that we, we, we uh, make use of our own channel to uh, produce, but there are a lot of media coverage and news uh, being covered, uh, all our projects are being covered. And uh, we try to use all these uh, materials uh, and engage all the sectors to come over and have a look. And then by, you know, producing all these videos and images, we can circulate it in the whole entire community. And also because we have been engaging people uh, from different sectors and they can be our, you know, our promoters in their own sectors. So, and that's why, as I said, three years ago, nobody in Hong Kong understand what we are talking about when we say, when we advocate for transitional housing. But now after the launching of community move, uh, housing movement uh, with a couple of uh, news media events, people, of course there are pros and cons. They are, con they are, uh, they are discussion and sometimes you know, argument about whether, oh, you are going to house two households in one single unit, this kind of co-living is not going to work, this kind of thing. But, you know, the, the incitement of this course, the incitement of this kind of discussion is itself one of the major uh, thing that we would like to see. And ho we hope that this kind of discussion can be sustained in the community so that this kind of initiative can be, you know, promoted and also get, you know, uh, uh, renew and, you know, revise, you know, the approach may not be right, but, you know, after several years, we could uh, uh, um, modify it. The other part that uh, uh, your, 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 your faculty asked me to talk about is, uh, is how I bumped in, how, how, if you would like to pursue a, you know, policy, research and advocacy or policy advocacy kind of work, uh, what are the channels or what are the, uh, the opportunities out there? What, what uh, I think, I think uh, uh, in maybe in recent two decades, there are a lot more opportunities. Uh, in the old days, uh, if you work on policy advocacy, if you like to pursue a career in policy advocacy, uh, you have two, I think even now you have two major paths, I think. The first path, which most of the social workers who are fond of community development approach will engage themselves in, which is to join a grassroots NGO somehow, Chen Yu is actually coming from that, you know, <laughs> That, uh, that path, you know, join an NGO and then uh, to, to, uh, to get to know about the needs of community and the problems that the tenants are facing. And sometimes you leverage on resources to help them facilitate mutual help and that kind of thing. And sometimes you have to be an advocate, voice out their needs, voice out their problems. And sometimes you even have to organize them and confront the government, asking the government to, you know, change policy and, you know, uh, having more measures to alleviate the problem. That is one of the major path. A lot of people are, but that path, of course, you have, as I said uh, to uh, Julia, saying that uh, if you are going to uh, work on policy research, uh, policy advocacy, you have to be prepared that your monetary reward is not very high, or maybe much lower than the median income <laughs> of a first graduate in Hong Kong. And, and, it, and on the other hand, your workload is very high. <laughs> so you may have to be, be prepared that you have to work day and night, nonstop, because you have to be with the uh, tenants and residents all the time because their needs uh, are expressed not in a defined 
working hours, okay? Defined period of working hours, you can understand that, right? So the other path is more, now this path, the, the, the path that I just mentioned is what I would say, according to those, those kind of state theory, okay? More like a society center approach of advocacy, okay? You work with organization or people in the society trying to, you know, create something and voice out your, voice out your opinion or voice out your recommendations and hoping that the government may change. The other path is to work in the institution that is the institutional focus, okay? You work in the institution, by institution, what we mean is, I think our council is more like a in-between, but some of the NGOs will see us more as an institutional player because our major target of work is to hook up with the government, try to talk to them and appeal, you know, using their language, appeal to the support to our proposal. So things like community housing movement and modular housing movement, the major thing that we would like to do is to make our demand more intelligible institutionally. And of course, if this uh, idea can be more intelligible in the community, that would be good. So that's why I said, on the one hand, we work with the institutions like the government and the department, but also on the other hand, we hope that these uh, materials and video and images and you know, passages or articles can be circulated in the community. So we are sort of in between, but if you want to pursue a truly purely institutional approach, then the first thing you may want to think about is to be an AO in the government. So you work in the government and try to, you know, actually work on the policy. Some of them are having this uh, mission by joining the government, they do not just want to uh, get a well-paid job and regular, you know, a stable job, but they really want to do something within the government try, by trying to take part in policy making process. The other channel that I don't know how many we, of you would pursue is to, uh, to get yourself elected in the legislature or in the district council. So you get yourself involved in all these uh, statutory body. And also if you are working in NGOs or if you are working in the private sector or even in the education sector, you may have other chance to be co-opted or to be invited by the government to join different kinds of uh, advisory uh, committees or uh, you know, those kind of uh, uh, platform, which are very much institutional based, but uh, you don't have real power. You don't have power to mobilize resources. You just give opinion to the government. But in, you like it or not, I mean, you still have a channel to talk about your thing. I mean, the government may not hear or listen to what you say, but at least you have a channel to try to influence the policy. So I think uh, as Hong Kong is moving towards uh, uh, um, a new era, uh, I think um, we should be trying to uh, develop more such channels, whatever is, uh, either from a society center approach or from an institutional center approach uh, or state center approach. I think there are a lot of avenues that you may pursue. And, and of course, to be prepared yourself to uh, join either of these paths, you have, of course, you have to um, get yourself equipped with the basic knowledge about I think research is unavoidable. <laughs> you have to be very, very well equipped. But of course, you have to get yourself familiar with different kind of policy areas, particularly those you are uh, really concerned with. So, uh, so I think the new program that Hong Kong is now trying to launch, I think is trying to address this kind of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, body of knowledge. Uh, trying to address this issue and try to develop a new body of knowledge and then try to equip students from different faculties, hoping that more and more uh, advocacy, either working in the society or working in an institution can contribute 
to uh, social policy development in Hong Kong. Maybe I should round up here because he said that I, I will be allowed to talk about talk for maybe 30 minutes, right? So I guess it's time for uh, questions. Okay. Thank you, Anthony, for your sharing. So I think um, because we have a time limitation, so maybe we can take two or three questions from the floor. So, I learned uh, that the questions usually comes uh, from uh, the chat, chat room. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Um, so the participant, if you want to raise your question, either just speak or uh, type in the chat room. Yeah, free to raise your questions about the uh, social housing project or um, or the, the strategy of policy advocacy nowadays in Hong Kong. Or even about the career, the career planning <laughs> for uh, working in the um, uh, policy sector. Oh, but if you want to understand my career, my career path is really not that uh, smooth, even though I've been working in the council for 20 years, more than 20 years. But before that, I, I was just wandering around from different sectors. The first job I had is at Hong Kong U as a research assistant, helping like on God <laughs> to work on, you know, something about you know, student participation in the community, something like that. And then I, 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 I was a social worker, school social worker for maybe six months. And after that, I joined the Hong Kong U again as a social, as a researcher. And uh, somehow after a couple of uh, job at the university, I, I work at Poly U as well in, uh, in the education sector, education research. And then before I joined the council, I work in Poly U, yeah, too. So, I, after I joined the council, I was, uh, by the time I joined the council, I, I was a research officer. And then after a couple of years, I moved to another department called International Regional Networking. So I had five years of uh, my career spending on an area which I, which I am most unfamiliar with. And most, uh, I, in any case, that kind of work is not what I like, but in any case, I've been working there for five, I worked there for five years, uh, just to network with uh, stakeholders of social welfare in the com international community and also in the, mainland China, in the mainland China. And then after that five years, I moved back, back to uh, policy research and advocacy. So before picking up this uh, transitional social housing, which now have, I think it turned into maybe 60% of my time, I actually really focused on policy research and advocacy. There was a time I actually work on uh, social enterprise and social entrepreneurship too. Uh, but now I'm, I have to be very focused anyway, just to add some introduction. Anthony, actually, I just typed a question from me. Okay. Uh, I think this is a new challenge for the council or the NGO mm. collaborate with the corporate sector. Mm. For example, in terms of mm. they, they lease the land or lease the, the property to, mm. to you. So mm. is there any kind of uh, challenges in terms of policy or in terms of collaboration relationship? I, I think uh, it's very interesting that uh, in this experience of uh, our collaboration with Henderson, there is not much challenge, in fact. They've been, they've been very supportive. There's, uh, but before that, I mean, uh, why, we, uh, why we could have this opportunity of leveraging a piece of land from the developer, that is a long-term effort of the council. I think because since I forgot, maybe 15 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, uh, we embarked on a project called Caring Companies Scheme. So we started as a social work, a social welfare organization, we started to network with people from outside of the social welfare sector, mainly the corporate sector, okay? And then we started to peel a network of over, I think now maybe about 5,000 corporate companies in Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of them are, are big banks, also big developers. And because of this network and ongoing uh, relationship building with all this corporate sector 
And that's why we would have this opportunities by bumping into just a piece of land. Maybe I think my boss maybe bump into a a a, a leader in Henderson on a, I don't know what kind of occasion and say that oh we are quite interested in modular social housing. Oh really? I I I've got a piece of land. Maybe you could make use of that. I think that may be the kind of uh, conversations that they had. So um but in the process of developing that piece of land, I I actually couldn't recall there's any challenge or difficulty in working with them because I think the council has over the years has been a trusted uh, organization among the corporate sector already. So I think they they rest their trust on us. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Anthony, for your sharing.